Now? Okay. So I was saying thank you to the organizers for putting together this conference so and giving me the chance to be here. So the motivation for this paper uh, is twofold. One uh, is actually the conference itself. I, I prepared the, the paper for the conference, so I was uh, not working on this topic for a long time. And, and, uh, and, and as the second motivation is the, the current emphasis on high-dimensional uh, models, not in the uh, semi-parametric sense, traditional semi-parametric sense, but the high-dimensional covariate setting. So I, I look at uh, uh, things that I did in the past, and I, I'm trying to impro improve the, those things. So, so the setting is a, is a setting for testing conditional moment restrictions, potentially uh, multivariate uh, uh, conditional moment restriction, depending on data and a parameter. And the dimension of the parameter is, is P. And the dimension of, of the regressors is DX. So the key issues that I look at here are situations where P and DX are potentially high, finite, but potentially high, very high. And for example, in, in, in this setting, a method that is becoming very popular is, is lasso. And what happens with lasso is that it's not asymptotically linear. It doesn't have an asymptotic uh, linear representation. And that turns out to be an assumption in, in much of this literature on testing, non-parametric testing for conditional moments. And I'm trying to relax that and, and modify a, te a test to, to be able to handle estimators like lasso with high dimensional uh, regressor. So that's basically the idea, the problem I'm looking at. Originally, I wanted to do this in time series, but theory became a bit more complicated. So I, I restrict the analysis so far to IID, although it could be, in principle, extended to time series. So let me motivate this uh, kind of problem. So the leading example is perhaps a linear model, linear regression model estimated by lasso. And this is done these days uh, a lot. And lasso is a penalized uh, least square uh, estimator. And you have to choose the bound with lambda, the penalization parameter. And typically, people do some kind of cross-validation to choose lambda. The theory of this estimator, surprisingly, was done as late as 2000. And it's a bit ugly. It's a, it's similar to the problem of estimating a parameter at the boundary of the parameter space. It's a kind of projected normal distribution into a cone. So it's not asymptotically linear. Uh, uh, and there's not much work done on goodness of fit for models estimated by Lasso. And a recent paper is by San Bullman in, in the Journal of Royal Statistical Society B. Uh, that test is not consistent, though. It's, uh, it's not. Uh, an omnibus test. So a second example would be a nonlinear version of uh, the previous case, which is, for example, a probit lasso. You are perhaps modeling a binary uh, dependent variable Y, and you use, for example, the probit uh, model, and you can also penalize the estimator, and that's the probit uh, la lasso estimator uh, based on the likelihood. And for example, there is this applied paper uh, in medicine using logit lasso for predicting the performance of uh, several covariates uh, and the, uh, for the problem of predicting breast uh, cancer. So, so one issue in all these settings is uh, checking whether the model is correct and what are the implications of that for, for the problem at hand. So a third example closer to what I have been doing lately is uh, in finance, for example, people care a lot about details and in particular uh, something called value at risk, which is nothing else than a conditional quantile for, a, for an extreme quantile level. Here extreme means not, not too extreme, something like 5% or 1%. That's kind of typical choices. And for example, you could use yeah, a linear model uh, and estimate a linear quantile regression model with the estimator proposed by Quenker and uh, Bassett. And that falls into this setting where 
the H function would be an indicator function. So it would be a non-smooth function. Uh, you could also, of course, consider other models different from normal if you want. Uh, recently, uh, this literature on, on value at risk has moved from, from the value at risk, which, which is not a good measure of risk uh, according to some standards in, in, in the literature. And people have used this expected sorful as an alternative. Is the mean over the tail. So knowing that you are in the tail, what is the mean? And this accounts not only for the, for the likelihood uh, of losses, but also for the magnitude. So uh, how big is going to be the loss? It's a, it's a measure of risk. It's a better measure. It's, it's so-called coherent. There's no much done on this, actually, in, in the uh, testing part, uh, econometrics part. Uh, so, for example, you could use a parametric model for the expected surfall, depending itself on the value at risk model, and you could test jointly this, uh, the value at risk and the expected shortfall. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any tests uh, for this joint hypothesis, or omnibus tests for this joint hypothesis, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm not, uh... So that could be another example motivating, uh, in this particular case, a multivariate uh, conditional moment restriction, possibly with non-smooth functions, uh, so the literature is very extensive. So I'm just dividing the literature in two part, in two kind of uh, inconsistent tests and consistent tests. You know, inconsi inconsistent test. Uh, so the null is the conditional moment restriction holds. The alternative is doesn't hold. So there are some alternatives that can, cannot be detected by some of these tests. And this, there is a long history on this, and I'm giving some reference here. Although there are many more. Okay. The same for consistent tests. It's a very long uh, literature. So there is a very nice survey by Benthes uh, in test uh, and, and Krujeras. Uh, you, can, you can check that paper for a review of the literature. Some history, Behrens in 1982, he proposed uh, this integrated conditional moment test, essentially extending the characteristic function approach from distributions to regressions, uh, to uh, kind of the integrated regression. And there is a very important paper by Winfred, too, in 97 in annals, using indicator functions. And there are papers by many of the uh, people here in the audience. Uh, for example, Miguel Delgado and co-authors, they have a paper actually on conditional moment restrictions, a setting similar to this one here. The comment that I made before is the, is the motivation for this paper, which is that most of these tests actually require, as an assumption, an asymptotic linear representation for the estimator. And LASSO, which is a very popular estimator these days, the paper has more than 30,000 citations, I believe, uh, doesn't satisfy that. So, so I want to be able to, to allow for this in, a, in an omnibus test. So that's the motivation, and that's what I'm, I'm doing here. So what is the, this paper about? The idea is basically I'm going to take a standard kind of omnibus test, and I'm going to go back to the roots. Uh, Anil was pointing this C alpha test by Neyman. I think that's a fundamental paper. And he actually taught us how, how to deal with testing with nuisance parameters. And I think this should be done systematically in any problem. Unfortunately, it's not. And that's the, that's the main idea here. I'm just I'm doing uh, something very simple. I'm taking this standard omnibus test and applying the C alpha idea in a semi-parametric setting or non-parametric setting. So that's, and the test I'm choosing is th this test that I did with, based on, on half spaces, because it's kind of very good with dealing with high dimensional covariates, and I'm combining these two ingredients. The, an omnibus test based on half spaces with uh, uh, kind of name and orthogonalization to deal with the problem that the estimator I'm using uh, uh, doesn't have a linear representation. So the, the idea is that if you think of a model as, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surface, or then deviations uh, tangent to the model, you cannot detest, detect those. And the idea is to account for that. So account for the fact that there are, there are local alternatives that you cannot detect. And you can use that information. That, that is information that uh, according to semi-parametric efficiency theory, 
we need to account if you want to do something uh, efficient. So these are the features of the test. So you, you don't need any more linear representation. Root n consistency would, would go. And then I want to stay away from smoothing if, if possible, so not turning parameters. In simulations, I'm, I'm going to show you that it has, with some DGPs that have been used in the literature by others, it has good finite sample performance, even in cases where the dimension is pretty high. Uh, it's computationally very simple, and that's actually a, a very strong motivation, and I'll be precise later. It's, uh, it's very simple to, to compute the, the test. Um, and there are other features that are not maybe as relevant, but yeah. You could, in principle, have settings beyond regression, so settings where you cannot do the classical kind of wild bootstrap construction uh, non smooth ten moments as well. So let me go a bit more into details. As I say, the, mo the null hypothesis, the conditional moment restriction holds. The alternative is uh, the negation, it doesn't hold. I'm going to assume for simplicity that yeah, there is a unique theta zero, so there is uh, identification of theta zero. Uh, and there's a big literature on this, so papers by Hermann Behrens, Winfred, myself. So the idea of this approach was to transform the set of conditional moments into many unconditional moments. And there are many ways to do this, similar to many ways to characterize a distribution, like a CDF, characteristic function. There are many ways to do this. So here I'm going to use these half spaces. And the motivation is uh, because I want to deal with high-dimensional covariates. Uh, but there are many other ways, again. So the null hypothesis is characterized by, here it's important that you, you need to characterize this, you need to look at all possible directions, beta. And they're normalized to be in the sphere. So the dimension, so the dimension is uh, uh, dx minus one, actually. And, and there's a, yeah, the u is in the real line. So it's, it's basically kind of the Kramer wall device uh, method applied to, to testing. And, and then, this is something that characterizes the null, and it's an unconditional moment, so we can apply the sample analog, standardized, and this is a process in beta and u, and I did this in 2006, a long time ago, and, and uh, yeah, the theory is pretty standard. By the way, the theory of this paper is very standard. It's not fancy, uh, nothing new uh, there in terms of the theory. Uh, okay, so what is the ingredient I'm putting here? Basically, Neyman said he did this in the context of likelihood. So if you have a, a testing problem and you have nuisance parameters, he said we should always project the score of the parameter of interest orthogonal to the score of the uh, nuisance parameters. So in a finite dimensional case, that's easy and but relatively easy, and that's what he did. But the same principle applies generally. Take any semi-parametric model with nuisance parameters. There is some, so, something so-called tangent space of nuisance parameters, and you can project orthogonally into that. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you, can, you, you need to project in the, in the orthogonal space. It doesn't have to be an orthogonal projection, actually. And in some, and some cases, actually, it makes sense not to do that because it's complicated. Like, for example, here, if you, if you were to use the so-called efficient score, what Neyman did in this context, that would involve the conditional variance, and you would need to smooth the data. So it's easier not to do that, maybe, and then just use kind of a standard orthogonal projection of the uh, residuals, H, based on the score G. G is the score of the model, and, and this is just not, geometrically, this is an orthogonal projection into that. So it's very easy to, to do. And then that accounts for the fact that you don't know the parameters theta. So that accounts is basically this C alpha idea or, or related to that. So this moment, if you were to look at the uh, population analog of this, has actually zero derivative with respect to theta zero. That's why I call this locally robust. So the, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, and that's why you don't need this, this linear representation anymore. So there's, 
the asymptotic distribution will not depend on the, distribu on the asymptotic distribution of the estimator. So that's basically the idea. And the test is based on, on this process. It's a kramer volmeises type test. I integrate you using the, the empirical distribution of the projections. And then to account for all possible projections, I use the uniform uh, measure. If you, th if you have a prior on some directions that are more important than others, you could change this measure. Also, the computation will change, of course. So, uh, yeah. An omnibus approach perhaps doesn't do that, and then yeah, we use uh, I use the uniform measure there. Surprisingly, and this was a surprise to me back in 2006, turns out that there is a closed form expression for this, and it's very easy. I, I think there's a strong motivation for using this. It's very it's a, it's a very easy to compute, and I'll show you later details on this. Okay. Asymptotic theory, again, is, is very standard. I'm not going to go in, into details here. Uh, so I'm going to, in principle, I could do a Hilbert space approach. I remember when I was a PhD student, Winfred saved me from going through the pain of proving tightness with the soup norm in a very complicated setting, and that saved a long time to me. And uh, I'm very thankful, by the way. I never thank you in public, but that was very good. The same could be done here. Could you, in principle, because I'm looking at Kramer von Mises, I don't need this uniform approach, which is uh, harder. I could do a uh, Hilbert space, but uh, yeah, I did it the, the kind of a standard soup uh, approach. And the only thing I want to comment here is, is this thing that I said before that I don't need this expansion any. I don't need this assumption anymore. I only going to require uh, root and consistency. And again, Lasso satisfies this but it does not satisfy this. So the limiting distribution under the null, I'm, I didn't put the assumptions there, very standard, is a Gaussian process. Uh, one issue here is that actually there is no impact from estimating theta zero. So the limiting distribution is the same as if you use theta zero instead of theta n in, in the process. Uh, so that's kind of the local robustness. So it's very standard, and the continuous mapping theorem, with some modification, applies because this is uh, estimated as well. But yeah, that's very standard. So the limiting distribution is, is that, which is very hard to approximate. And I'm going to show you later how to do that with bootstrap. It's, a very, it's very easy. But before that, let me go into a bit uh, investigation of, of power properties. Again, relatively standard uh, things that have been studied in the literature. I uh, study in this econometric theory paper the power properties of, of omnibus, this integrated conditional moment uh, test and related test, and the same kind of uh, things apply here. So I'm going to look at local alternatives with rate root n, and you can assume, and I claim here without loss of generality, that the direction is orthogonal to the score. I'm saying this because actually you cannot detect local alternatives in the direction of the score. That's a limitation of, of the information we have. It's impossible. And the limiting distribution is the same Gaussian process uh, plus a, a drift, which is given by this. And, uh, and if you look uh, closely at the local power, it's a bit depressing. I actually kind of not stop working on this, but I, when I learned that, I got a bit depressed. I thought these omnibus tests were great. But then if you look at the local power, it's basically flat. Uh, it's only kind of non-trivial in a finite dimensional space, essentially. And that's, that's very kind of, uh, but that's life. You know, it's, it's, it's too ambitious, right, what we're trying to do, to do here. With finite number of observations, do non-parametrics, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of tricky, no? So you, you see that here. You can formalize that by looking at the local power. And, but never, nevertheless, yeah, we, we, uh, they're called omnibus. Uh, the global power is actually different from the standard one because now we co because we're doing this projection, you actually lose something in principle. You lose something because, yeah, you're, you're not able to detect models that are collinear with the score. But in some 
again, in some cases, that's not actually a limitation because that's life. I mean, you cannot detect in a linear model, for example, you cannot, this is not really an alternative. <laughs> uh, so it depends, I guess, on how you define the estimator and the limit and how you identify the parameter. It depends whether this is a limitation or not. But there are some studies. Strasser actually tried to develop results on bounds on global po power based on local power. And, and you can claim that, yeah, this is not truly an, a, a limitation. So booster approximation. So one advantage of doing this orthoanalysis is that the bootstrap is extremely simple. It's basically a multiplier type bootstrap. You just, you don't need to re-estimate the parameters. You don't need to do cross-validation for estimating lasso in each bootstrap and do cross-validation for each bootstrap sample. You don't need to do that. Just multiply uh, the residuals, the original residuals by VI, IID sample with zero mean unit variance uh, and bounded support for, for the theory to be easier, but you don't need that, in fact. Uh, so examples are kind of classical examples. You use the literature Rademacher variables. And this bootstrap works. Uh, so uh, that's the theorem proving that the bootstrap works. It's very standard again. So let me go directly to the simulation. So, so I'm, I'm actually choosing this recent paper in Annals of Statistics by Tan and, and Zhu Lizing could, couldn't make it to the conference, but yeah, this is exactly the same as, as DGPs they use. So I don't use my own DGPs. This is their DGPs, data generating processes. And I'm, so basically it's a linear model. The first block of simulations is going to be testing a linear model against some alternative. So this is a kind of exponential alternative, cosine, square, and the setting is one where there is a sparsity. Uh, perhaps yeah, that's a typical situation where you want to apply lasso. So the p original dimension, only d of the coefficients are, are non-zero. And there is a sparse, the sparsity level is, one, is 10%. Uh, x follows a multivariate normal distribution. Epsilon is also independent of x and normal. And the null corresponds to z equals zero. The alternative is z different from zero. And I'm going to estimate theta zero by lasso uh, using tenfold cross validation. Again, that's basically the standard approach in practice. That, that's what people do in, in practice for estimating uh, linear models with high, high dimensions. OK, I mentioned before that the test was computationally simple. This is actually the test. It's, it's, very, it's a quadratic form in the residuals. H is the classical projection metrics. And the only kind of a bit more complicated thing is this weight, this weighting matrix W, which has this uh, IS element. And I learned today that Eduardo has just written a package in R computing these metrics. So you can use that package, uh, GOF FD, no, uh, GOF FDA is the name of the package. And you can, that gives you this, this uh, metric, so you can just use that matrix. The good thing is that when you do bootstrap, you don't need to compute this anymore, this matrix. Just multiply this quadratic form by, or the residuals by an external uh, sequence VIs, and then do this many times, and that uh, will give you the bootstrap critical value. And uh, so, uh, so this is convenient when n is large. You don't have to compute large uh, dimensional matrices many times. And you don't need to re-estimate in each bootstrap iteration. So that's, uh, so even though the test is omnibus, it's not more difficult computationally than standard things. I mean, and this is really, with the package now from Eduardo, this is really three lines in, in R, right? So. So I, I'm going to compare with other omnibus tests. So I, uh, so I want to compare tests that are kind of comparable. Uh, so this is also omnibus. And it's, based, it's basically what I'm doing. I'm taking Winfred's uh, 97 test. And I'm pro also doing the projection to be able to justify the theory with lasso. 
And then the only thing that changes is that the weighting metrics, instead of the previous one, based on half spaces. By the way, there is a closed form. I didn't mention that, but there is a closed form solution to this, and that's what Eduardo uh, coded. Here, you can also do that. I mean, here is also very easy to compute. Uh, this is the multivariate indicator, so you need to account for uh, uh, each component. And, and, but it's also quadratic form. The bootstrap is also very easy, and so on. And I'm going doing the same for the Behrens original test based on the uh, characteristic function. And when you use the integrating measure, the multivariate normal, then you get this weight, uh, weighting matrix, WBB, with these elements, exponentials. So things that you see this morning uh, with the characteristic function of the Gaussian. Uh, so keep in mind this kind of expression because it's going to explain what happens in, in, uh, in simulations and also uh, is related to the, uh, uh, Dolores' uh, talk today. Uh, so keep, keep in mind this kind of expression. I think this is very interesting. Okay, so this is... Uh, Rejection probabilities at 5%, nominal level 5%, sample size is 100 and 300, two choices for dimension, 7 and 11, and I'm comparing the three tests, Behrens type tests, Winfred type tests, indicator-based, and half a space-based uh, test. All of them projections. The null hypothesis, the alternative, with this choice of Z. Uh, what we see is that Behrens test has almost close to zero rejection probability. As the dimension grows, this is more and more uh, likely to happen. So my explanation of that, and probably someone has found this before, uh, when the dimension grows, this goes to zero. Uh, so, so, uh, so the test statistic takes the value zero. So uh, indicator-based test, so Winfred's uh, test, is more robust to the dimensionality, but it has a bit some size distortions, so maybe 30%. Per 30, 30 so so and the, uh, as the dimension grows, the distortions are higher. So for 11, you see higher distortions. And the half-space-based test is able to control the size, I mean, to uh, closer to 5%. For power... I mean, this is okay. Having zero type 1 error is great, but then you pay a price in terms of power. So Behrens test has almost no power, and as you grow in dimension, then zero power, and indicator-based test is also highly affected by dimensionality. Uh, half a space is more robust, and even for 11, you also have, you know, you have, in some cases, yeah, of course there are alternatives that... Uh, um, cannot be detected. So uh, theoretically, all these tests are admissible. So, so depending on the alternative, one test could be better than the other. But um, I also look at nonlinear models with higher values of dimension, similar kind of results. Zero pro rejection for uh, exponential base. So I guess in the limit, I don't know what's going to happen in the limit, but in the limit, uh, using exponential, using characteristic function with depending on the integrated measure you use, but it's very likely that my, my explanation is that the kernel is very smooth of, of the Gaussian process, so the eigenvalues go to zero exponentially fast. So in, in fact, it's kind of a parametric test. It's more, not, it's more parametric than other non-parametric tests in some sense. So, and I did an extreme case where I choose 25 and 100, and uh, exponential indicators go to zero. Half a spaces, they still do well in terms of size and in terms of, of power. So, so let me conclude because I have 10 seconds. So, so I have proposed kind of a, I took an, a well-known omnibus test and then applied this C alpha idea from Neyman to be able to handle lasso. It's computationally simple. Is more robust than competing methods to high dimensionality. And it can be, the principle is kind of geometric, so it could be extended to other models, semi parametric models, estimated as scores. And with time series, if you use, yeah, if you require some weak dependence, it's also possible to extend that. And that's interesting, particularly for this application with 
value at risk and expect the sorrowful because it's, it's for time series. So thank you very much for, for everything. The reason for low power, the reason for low power, again, my explanation is that the eigen, if you look at the, this spectral representation of the Kramer von Mises, the eigenvalues, in the case of indicators, it's going to behave something like j to the power of the dimension. And as the dimension grows, you're down weighting. So it's only able to, to, to get information from the very first kind of principal component. That's, that's my explanation. I think that is missing in the literature, actually. A, a good explanation of what happens with the dimensionality of, and I learned about Winfred's uh, thesis work on, on uh, rates of convergence for uh, empirical processes depending on the dimension, right? But that's for the convex, not the class of convex set, which is bigger than. So it would be nice to have that for the class of indicators, class of half spaces, and perhaps the rate will show up there differently. What do you think? No. It's a whole nice situation. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I don't know. But that's my explanation. I don't think it comes, because it's the same setting for all the tests. <coughs> it's the same the sparsity. Uh, I think it has to do more with the, with the eigenvalues. For the test of the stupid, which kind of estimator do you use for beta? I use, a, I don't estimate beta. Beta is integrated out. I use, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, Stute, Winfred's paper is not on the projection. So what is, what, what do you call beta? The estimator of the model yes. is what I call theta here. You so call it the projection. For theta, I use the same estimator as lasso yes. for all. Yeah, no, I, I, I know. There's no word that this should be easily uh, extended to the multivariate case. But 10 years later, 10 years later, I have um, a paper with Li Xing, you, and a PhD student called Li Xing. Uh, and in this biometrical paper, so we really discussed the multivariate situation. And that is different. This approach was different from the 90s. And maybe that is of some interest to you. And this Chinese uh, uh, student, she did a lot of simulation. And in, in all the cases she studied, and, and many of the results or the plots are in this biometrical data. So she said, I, I'm overwhelmed. saw the plots and uh, we studied sample size 65 but not too much and I remember the dimension was 15 50 15 ah, 15 15 and it's, yeah, it's large it's relative 65. to 65 is very large and, and the results were fantastic so uh, that is that is not just an extension of the 97 because in the, in the, I think, 2008 or so paper, we also provided um, a principal component analysis for the multivariate case. So yeah, I know the paper. Yeah, we can talk about it. I know the paper. During the coffee break. Yeah, I know the paper. Thank you.
Okay, so let me begin by thanking the organizers for uh, setting up this nice meeting and also for inviting me and giving me the chance to, to be here. I would like to, to talk about, well, the, the title of, of the talk, uh, maybe it's a bit loose, a bit uh, vague. What I'm uh, going to present is some approach to goodness of fit testing in which I would like to admit that most of the time models are false. And then what I'm trying to, to look is for some uh, model which is useful, not really true. I don't expect it to be true. And so this is going to be the, the scheme of the talk. I will try to, to, to give some uh, discussion about approximate validation of models, which is something that uh, goes back for, uh, it has been a, a classical topic for a long, long time. And then I will present some uh, approach to, to a particular type of approximate validation of models, which is based on uh, trimmings and in trimmed cosmograph distance. I will try to explain what is it uh, later. And finally, we'll try to present some applications. So these are just two uh, samples for which I am plotting a QQ normality plot. Uh, this uh, corresponds to samples of a size about 25,000, and these are just the, the, the height in centimeters of a group of females on the left, uh, the upper row, and a similar size uh, on the right for, for, for males. We see from this uh, QQ plot that there is reasonably good agreement to, to normality. Uh, but if, if we combine the two samples together and we take a look at the, at the picture below, then well, perhaps one would be tempted to say that, well, after all, we, we, we have some good uh, fit to the normality model. But if we go quantitative and we uh, perform a kolmogorov smirnov for instance, normality test, so with estimated parameters, then the p-value, the rejection p-value for the, for the females is uh, close to uh, 0.3 is uh, close to 0.54 for the group of males. So we could say, OK, these data come from a normal model. But if we, if we do the same for the combined sample, then we, we get a very, very difficult, uh, different result. The, the, the p-value is very, very small. So we have strong evidence against normality. The point here, I think, is that, OK, maybe the combined sample is not normal, but really, is the normal model a good description of the, of the uh, random generator of the, of the data? Because um, this has been uh, repeated again and again for a long time. I'm quoting this sentence from uh, Bergson. For every data generating mechanism, there exists a sample size at which the model failure will become obvious. So if, 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 you, if you admit this thing, then what's the point in, in having this conference about goodness of fit? Because if you have a large sample, which we, we hope we will have, then we are going to reject. Then what's the point of a goodness of fit te test? OK, then let's uh, try to, 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 to take this thing in a positive way. And let's admit, OK, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Let's try to, to use for some useful model for the representation of the data. Several authors have, have been uh, dealing with this approach. Uh, I, I would make a distinction. Some uh, approach would be, OK, we have a, a model, and we say that the model is a good uh, representation, a good, uh, a useful representation for the data if a typical sample from that model looks not too different from, a sample, uh, from the sample at hand. That's the approach uh, followed by Davis in the paper called Data Features, and more recently by some other authors. And I, I will go later back to, to the approach by Lindsay and Liu uh, with the so-called credibility indices. Uh, a different thing would be, uh, OK, let's think about the model. And let's uh, choose a metric. In principle, we have uh, many different choices. And then we could say that a uh, model gives a good description of the random generator of the data if, in some metric, uh, the distance is uh, below some threshold. So this has been explored by many authors. Um, but we have two difficult choices here, which are crucial. 
One is, uh, of course, what is the right threshold? And for many authors, the, 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 the answer is, okay, ask the practitioner, they will know. Um, okay. And then we also have the interpretation. Um, there are some choices of the metric, which I believe uh, are better for the interpretation of, uh, uh, well, wh what is the meaning of, of, of this uh, closeness to, 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 the, to the true random generator of the, of the metric. Um, but for the choice of, of the metric, we have to, 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 to get a balance between two different things. One is, of course, interpretability, and the other thing is testability. Can we test anything that, you, that we want? Maybe not. I, I would like to, to recall some results in a paper by Bergron in 1988, in 1989 in the, in the annals. Um, ideally, I would like to, to choose uh, a metric which is strong enough so that if, if this distance is small, then it, means, it should mean that P and, and P naught, the, the model, now let's go to, to a very simple fixed model, only one representative in the family. Well, uh, I would like to, to be able to conclude that if this is small, then from every point of view, P and P naught are similar. So this uh, means, or this suggests, that we should look for a strong metric, like the distance in total variation, or Hellinger matrix, or, or uh, maybe not a metric, but a divergence, the kullback leibler for instance. And more generally, we could consider this type of null models that would be uh, something in the reader neighborhood around P naught, which is given by this uh, expression here. Here we have two parameters. The case epsilon equal to zero corresponds to distance in total variation, but if we take delta equal to zero, then this corresponds to the so-called contamination neighborhoods, which are the very basis of robust statistics. These were uh, proposed by Hoover in, in uh, some papers in the, in the 60s. So the alpha contamination neighborhood around P0 is the set of all probabilities, which are uh, one minus alpha fraction equal to P0 plus something different. So they can be uh, equivalently expressed in this way, so they actually correspond to, the, to some particular case of reader's neighborhood. And this type of uh, contamination neighborhoods admit a very simple interpretation. If, if P can be expressed in this way, this means that one minus alpha percent of the data come from the model, and then there's a fraction, hopefully a small fraction, which cannot be accounted for from that model. Um, so we can consider that part of the sample as outliers. Now, uh, in that paper by Baron, he proves that you cannot consistently test anything that you want. If, if, we, if we try to perform a test on the basis of, of uh, IID samples, then we would say that the test is uniformly exponentially consistent if we can uh, Proof that both the type 1 and type 2 errors probabilities decrease like uh, e to negative r times n, n is sample size, and r should be some positive constant. Well, it turns out that if I want to, to test the, the null model p equal to p naught against the alternative, the distance between p and p naught is greater than a fixed threshold, then uh, if the distance is some kind of weak distance, like Kolmogorov-Smirnov, something based on Vabnitsch-Ronenkin classes, or something based on finite variation, uh, along finite partitions, I mean, then there is a uniformly consistent test of, of the null against the alternative. But if, if, if D dominates the distance in total variation, and if the model is not a discrete model, then there is no uniformly consistent test of the null against the alternative in the sense above. No, no one at all. So it means that if, if, if uh, okay, maybe it's interesting, as I said before, to, to try to, to test the, the null model uh, is uh, close to the random generator of the data in, this, in, in total variation, 
but uh, that would be just wishful thinking. I cannot test that. Um, but what I would like to, to present here is that if I am happy with the contamination neighborhoods, then there's a uniformly consistent test, uniformly exponentially consistent in the sense above. Uh, also, if I modify the alternatives, uh, well, I can, I can consider alternatives that, that grow to the, to, to, to the complement of the contamination model. Uh, and I would like to, to mention, it's not really something that I would pay much attention later, that the roles of the null and the alternative here can be exchanged. So that if I reject this uh, kind of, of uh, uh, hypothesis, then I will conclude that the contamination model holds. I will have statistical evidence that, that the contaminated model holds. Okay, the, the tool for getting evidence for these contamination neighborhoods is through the duality between contamination neighborhoods and trimmings. What's a trimming of a probability? That's simply another probability which is absolutely continuous with respect to the, to the first one and such that the derivative is upper bounded by 1 over 1 minus alpha. And it turns out that P is a contaminated version of peanut if and only if peanut is a trimming of P. And it turns out also that these sets of trimmings have a very nice mathematical and statistical properties. From this point, actually, I'm focusing on univariate data. You may think it's poor, but it's a first step. Many of the things that I'm uh, talking about can be generalized uh, at a price. But if I consider the kolmogorov smirnov distance here, then it turns out that it's also equivalent the contamination model holds or the kolmogorov distance between the model and the set of trimmings is zero. And I, 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 I can tell you that this can be easily generalized to higher dimension. So um, I can uh, try to test fit to the contamination neighborhood by testing this kind of, of uh, null, the distance between the model and the set of trimmings of the random generator of the data is below a threshold against the alternative that it is above a threshold. There should be some separation between these two things if I want to get uh, exponentially small errors. And also, by dealing with this quantity here, I can uh, define some index, index of fit, uh, the minimum value such that the stream of distance is null, which, of course, would be the same thing as the minimum contamination level that I have to add to P naught so that, that P is a, contamination, a contaminated version of that P naught. Um, you could say, okay, why do you have to, to, to deal with these contamination neighborhoods? Because after all, you are dealing with a Kolmogorov distance and you have this set of implications. If the distance between peanut and P is less than a threshold, then the distance between peanut and the set of trimmings is also less than or equal to the same threshold. And if this happens, then uh, this, is, this uh, Kolmogorov distance between the model and the random generator is upper bounded by the same threshold plus alpha. Then one would be tempted to, to, to consider the simpler null, the distance in the Kolmogorov sense between peanut and P is less than or equal to, to alpha, for instance, taking rho equal to zero. But really, the two nulls are very different. And you can, you can check it from, from this uh, example here. If, if the model is the uniform distribution and the random generator is uniform in zero, one minus epsilon, epsilon positive, then you see that uh, really no matter the value of alpha, uh, you, 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 you will never improve fit here. So it's uh, never true that P naught is a correct generator for at least one minus alpha fraction of, of the data. Okay, now uh, I mentioned before that this uh, trim Kolmogorov uh, distance is a nice object from a mathematical and statistical point of view. And, well, you see the difference with respect to the distance in total variation in that, for instance, the naive, the, the plug-in estimator of the distance in total variation, you have two uh, samples coming from uh, distributions with a density. Um, if you generate data from the two distributions, even if the, they are the same, and the distance in total variation is zero, 
then the distance in total variation between the empiricals is going to be one, which is the, 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 the highest possible value. This is not uh, so with trimmings, so we can use the plugin estimator, we replace the unknown random generator by the empirical measure, and we get something which uh, we will see that is a consistent estimator, that we see that uh, is a consistent est estimator of, of the underlying quantity. Uh, also, I would like to mention that this uh, distance, and the mild assumptions can be computed as the, in, in this variational form, so we have to look for a minimizer in this set of continuous functions, absolutely continuous, taking the value of zero, at zero, one at one, and with a derivative, which is upper bounded, it's positive and upper bounded by this quantity. And from that, we see that the, the inf is really a minimum, the minimum is attained, and the minimizer can be explained, can be expressed in terms of, of these upper and lower envelopes of, of this function here gamma, which is uh, well, the composition here. Well, we have to, to detrend and then take the upper and lower envelope, but then we have this simple expression. That uh, expression um, works in the empirical case. So it means that the minimizer can be computed through a simple algorithm. We only have to, to transform the, the data through the model, then to order the sample, then to compute these uh, scores, the GA plus, the GA minus, with very simple operations. And then we have to compute this upper envelope and the lower envelope. And then we are done. This is going to give us a minimizer. And evaluating at the minimizer, we will get the, the distance. So this is very easy to implement. You can handle samples up to 100,000 observations very, very easily. Um, there's some asymptotic theory for this type of uh, trim Kolmogorov of distance. Um, well, the expression here, maybe it looks ugly, but it, the expression here is telling me that we can express the asymptotic distribution. We have this square root of n consistency, and the important thing is that everything can be expressed in terms of some Gaussian process. Um, of course, the distribution depends on uh, f and f naught. But the nice thing is that we can identify some uh, extremal cases in, in this uh, random variable here, which are good enough to uh, use this for applications that I will try to outline a bit later. Uh, now, I mentioned that I would like to, to, to test uh, this type of null hypothesis here. Uh, against the alternative. So if we base our rejection on large values of the empirical version of the trim column of distance, then we have something which is uniformly exponentially consistent. And even we have a very, very simple explicit control on the type 1 and type 2 error probabilities. If we take the case rho equal to 0, then we, we see that we can, we can test this thing here, which means we can test the null that the random generator is a, an alpha contaminated version of the of the data against the alternative and of course we can move the threshold to to make it uh, small and as long as um, eta n goes to infinity the tent would be the test would be uniformly consistent not exponentially but still uniformly consistent for this type of null against the alternative which uh, approaches the complement of of this uh, hypothesis here. Or alternatively, we can take the parameter lambda as a tuning parameter and look for uh, values which uh, guarantee that the type 1 and type 2 error probabilities are uh, smaller than epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. So for instance, if we do that, uh, we would be able to, uh, by, by uh, taking um, this um, fraction here, we would be able to detect uh, uh, alternatives at a uh, Kolmogorov distance, which is point one, uh, point 0.06, with sample size equal to uh, 1,000 and contamination level 10%. Okay, I have to go fast. From the CLT, uh, identifying those extreme cases, we can define an upper bound 
and a lower confidence bound, which uh, well, we see the expressions here, for the true value of this quantity. Um, here is a table with some simulations about the simulated, about the, the coverage uh, uh, frequency, observed coverage frequency, and you see that although those uh, upper and lower bounds came from identifying some uh, extremal cases, so in principle they are conservative, well, they are not so conservative. In some cases they uh, uh, approach the, 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 nominal, the nominal level. Uh, the upper row is the lower confidence bound. Uh, nominal level is uh, 95% and the uh, lower row is the upper confidence bound. Um, some, how much time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, maybe I think I, think I should uh, go very fast through this. If, if we reject the model, then we would like to, we would like to, to measure how useful is the, the model for uh, representing the data. Uh, some authors have considered this uh, credibility index. Delta credibility index is the sample size for which we would reject the model with probability delta. So in our setup, that would be this uh, quantity n delta defined through this equation. However, uh, we can define it like this, but it is not so easy to estimate. Uh, Lindsay and Liu estimated this through some subsampling scheme. Um, here, we have a different proposal, which is based on our asymptotic theory. Uh, it would be something like the expression here that we can consistently estimate. And also, we can um, define an estimator of this quantity, alpha star, the smallest value such that the contamination model holds. Um, our estimator comes from solving this equation here. We look for the smallest solution of, of this quantity, if, if there is one. Otherwise, that would be zero. And we can prove that this is almost surely consistent. Um, OK. Uh, we have performed some comparisons. If uh, Well, I really have no time for getting into details, but this minimal level of contamination such that the contamination level holds is very much connected to the false discovery rate. In, in several papers, it is really the proportion of uh, uh, null of, of, of observations that, that come from, not from the null, the proportion of uh, nulls that should be rejected that is of interest, and particularly lower confidence bounds for, for these quantities. So we have compared to a proposal by Genovese and Wasserman and with some uh, uh, variations by Mainshausen and, and Rice, also with this uh, alternative based on Kuiper's distance. And we see that in all cases, well, I'm uh, plotting here the uh, ratio between, this is a simulation scenario, so I'm plotting here the ratio between the uh, true level and the lower band, so we should be below uh, one, at least in 95% of the, of the time. And we see that there are some cases in which, well, uh, some of the proposals by uh, Wasserman, uh, well, they are a bit better, but there are some cases in which they fail badly, and however, our proposal works uh, better. And, okay, I will move to the conclusions. Uh, don't have time for, for these other things. So I, I have presented some approach to uh, testing contamination, t testing fit to contamination neighborhoods, which is based, based on the trim Kolmogorov distance. Um, the main features of the approach is that the statistics can be computed through very efficient and simple algorithms. Um, we have explicit control of, of error, of type 1 and type 2 error probabilities. We have also provided simple confidence bounds and if the null model is rejected, then uh, there are some indices of fit, although I didn't have much time to, to give details about that, which are available, which are useful measures of, of which is a better model uh, to, to account for the, for the data. And uh, for future work, I think there are some parts of, of, uh, of the material that I have presented that can be easily extended to more general models, 
And, well, the main challenge here to, would be to, to be able to deal with multivariate data. And there, there are two, two, two different uh, challenges here. Is that, well, the algorithms maybe should be adapted and maybe they are not so efficient. And, of course, there's the challenge of, of developing the asymptotic theory in that case. Uh, that was all. Thanks for your attention. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer to inviting me to this uh, excellent conference. And the work I'm going to talk today here is joined with uh, Ian Sun and Soyang Wang at Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, our object objective is to uh, develop a test procedure to distinguish whether a structural change is a sudden break or evolutionary break. This is the outline I'm going to have, and I have more than 70 slides, so I need to skip many of them. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, the idea in ecometric usually is to check whether model parameters are changing over time or structure, economic structure are changing over time. And the typical Formulation is assuming that the model parameter or distribution or structure change suddenly at the point of time. However, there are some uh, the, uh, motivation that in economics uh, it might be also uh, reasonable to consider changes, structural changes that change smoothly or evolutionary. So in order to see the relevant to economic literature, let me consider an example in macroeconomic, the so-called great moderation. So if you look at, this is a GDP growth rate in U.S. from 1965 to 2016. And uh, you can see that starting from mid-85, from mid-80, so from 1985, the upper variation the, uh, in terms of GDP growth rate, the variation of GDP growth rate actually diminished uh, between 1985 to 2005, and similar phenomena was also uh, observed for U.S. inflation rate. So this again is the uh, time series data for U.S. inflation rate from 1965 to 2016, and you can see that from uh, 1985, uh, the uh, variation of the uh, inflation rate also diminished significantly, but it diminished not in terms of uh, sudden changes, it has been diminishing over time smoothly and continuously. And that, that is what we mean by smooth structural changes. Uh, this is for U.S. data. We also consider Chinese data. Uh, Chinese data, the great moderation actually is even more striking. So this is a GDP growth rate in China from 1974 to 2016. And you see that studying from 1992 or 1993, the output variation become much smoother than, uh, than before. So this is a 70 and 80. The uh, variation of output growth is very rapid, uh, dramatic. But uh, after 1992, 93, it has become smoother. And similarly for inflation rate in China. So this is a uh, inflation rate data from 1978 to, uh, to recently. And you see that starting from 1999, the uh, variation in inflation rate is also diminished significantly. Uh, therefore, the work we are going to work in this paper is to, so let me jump. So the uh, purpose of this paper is to develop a consistent test to distinguish uh, evolutionary structural changes from a, a rough structural break. 
so my uh, paper here really does not related to change point because every point is changing uh, continuously. And uh, to our knowledge, there has been no such test in econometric literature. So uh, we try to fill this gap uh, using a non-parametric approach. So let me uh, describe a bit detail about the uh, framework where we are working on. So consider a linear regression model, uh, yt equal to xt prime alpha plus epsilon t, and alpha here is the model parameter. It is changing over time. So uh, we assume alpha is a function of the scale time, t over capital T. Capital T is sample size here. And in this paper, we are going to assume that alpha is changing, is a, is a continuous function. Actually, it's going to be a twice a differentiable function uh, except for a finite number of points where certain breaks are allowed. And uh, xt could be uh, a d-dimensional. So this is a multivariate uh, covariate in this case. And uh, the, uh, the null hypothesis we are interested in here is that the uh, alpha tau is a continuous function of time. So that is what we mean by uh, smooth changes or evolutionary changes. And the alternative is that the uh, alpha t is not continuous at this at some point of time. It could be a single point, or it could be a multiple point. And uh, so what we are going to do, the idea actually is quite straightforward. Uh, we are going to consider the, uh, the left limit and the right limit of every point in a sample time period. So assuming this, uh, this notation, alpha t minus is going to be the left limit of alpha t. And, uh, Alpha t plus is going to be the right limit of alpha t. And we are going to use a non-parametric estimation method, actually local linear estimator, to estimate both the left limit and right limit, and then compare whether their difference is converging to zero, a sample size t equal to infinity, or whether they are converging to a non-zero constant vector uh, in the limit. And uh, we need to check this every point of time t. So some sort of the global test is necessary here. If only a single point of time, then we construct a quadratic form comparing two different estimators. And that is going to be the uh, well-known Hausman test in econometric literature. It's going to be a chi-square. However, we have to consider every point. So Suppose we take a supreme norm over time, over the sample time periods, then this is going to be the supreme norm of a, a, a chi-square process, which is non-standard. And some sort of the uh, simulation method uh, is needed in order to obtain the critical value. Uh, so suppose that we first fix time t. So little t here is fixed. And then we consider observation in the neighborhood of time t. So s is going to be not very far away from time t here. And uh, then we could take a linear Taylor expansion in this case. So this uh, s is another time observation, time point, which is not very far away from t. And then we had a Taylor expansion around time t here. And this is the uh, parameter alpha s. We plug it into the linear regression model. So then we obtain the augmented linear regression. In addition to original xt, now we have a new regressor, which is going to be original xt multiplied by the time increment. So this zst is going to be a new regressor, two-dimensional, uh, 2D dimensional, if d is the original dimension of xt. And parameter theta contain original alpha at the time t and the first derivative of alpha at the time t. And uh, we are going to consider a, a minimization of local weighted sum of squared residuals uh, for each time t in order to estimate alpha, alpha t, the left limit and right limit of alpha t. However, uh, when we estimate that limit, this is going to, we are going to encounter a so-called boundary problem, which is pretty well known in non-parametric uh, literature. Because we could only, suppose we are going to estimate the lab limit, then we could only use historical data. We could only use the data before time t. The observation after time t cannot be used. 
Right. And similarly, if we are estimating the, the right limit of parameter alpha t, then we could only use observation after t. And again, that is going to be a boundary problem here. And linear, local linear estimator uh, somehow could solve the boundary problem in the sense that although it is a boundary, but the convergence rate, especially the bias, uh, bias term, is going to be this... Uh, converging to zero at the same rate as in the interior point. However, the scale, the proportionality are going to be quite different and tedious. So in order to solve that issue, uh, we are using a data reflection method to deal with the boundary problem. This was due to Hall and uh, Haldi uh, back in 1991. Uh, they proposed this method in space domain, and we extended it to time domain. So here is the idea. Uh, the, uh, suppose today I'm at the time t and I put a mirror here. So I'm going to diffract the data, right? The, uh, the t, uh, t minus 1 into t plus 1, t minus 2 into t plus 2, so that the data coverage will become symmetric. And uh, this is very similar to using a linear combination of the, uh, of the uh, kernel. So this is a kernel t plus s, t minus s, and a linear combination of the kernel at the boundary. So this is the local sum of square residual we are going to consider uh, with the augmented data. So the data, uh, this one is to estimate the lab limit of alpha t, but we already use the augmented data rather than just simply historical data. The augmented data, of course, is also from, from historical data, uh, but it has made the data symmetric. The Linear, local linear estimator set ahead has a closed form solution. So this is a weighted disk square estimation, right? With weighting function being kernel. I, sorry, I forgot to explain K. K here is the kernel function. And, and the, uh, Ts mean that it depends on the time distance, T minus S. And there's going to be a smoothing parameter H uh, or what we usually call the bandwidth involves. We allow the bandwidth to be time dependent. So at a different point of time, we allow a different bandwidth. Later on, we are going to discuss how to choose the different, uh, different bandwidths. And then uh, uh, theta, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this one actually is two-dimensional, including alpha and, uh, and the first derivative of alpha. So we are going to take out alpha only, and then the uh, alpha hat also, again, uh, has a weighted d square estimation. And I put L here, mean that this is uh, augmented data used to estimate the, right, the limit. Similarly, for the right limit, uh, we could also uh, de estimate it in exactly the same way as we did for the, uh, uh, the left limit estimator. So now, what we're going to do is to consider the maximum over the entire sample periods. And this is going to compare the left limit estimator and the right limit estimator. Uh, unlike the uh, structured uh, test literature, most tests in uh, this literature is checking whether they exist structural changes, right? The no hypothesis is that there's no structural change. The parameter is a constant. Here, our parameter under the no hypothesis could be changing over time. We just require that it must be continuous. So either it could be constant as uh, time changes, or it could just change continuously over time. And uh, we search over all possible t over the sample period, check this, uh, check this, whether the maximum go to zero. If the maximum go to zero, then the no hypothesis is correct. If the maximum converts to a non-zero constant, then of course uh, uh, the uh, alternative is going to be correct. Uh, in fact, uh, under the alternative, uh, this could also be used to obtain the uh, estimator for the, the change point or the break day. We could just choose T to minimize this uh, difference. And uh, we actually did this in the empirical application, although we don't have theory uh, for the distribution or for the property of this T hat. And there are some assumptions. I don't think I will go through. To gain... The insight about the uh, uh, distribution of the property of the test statistic, we did a bit uh, uh, linear uh, algebra here. 
So this is alpha hat, the, uh, and uh, the left limit estimator, this is uh, alpha hat, the uh, right limit estimator. It could be comp decomposed into two terms. The first term is related to bias. In the bias, this actually is the second derivative of the left limit. This is the second derivative of right limit. If we assume that alpha t is twice continuously differentiable, then actually this term is going to disappear. So the left limit minus right limit, the bias term is going to be up to even higher order, the h with power 3 rather than just simply with power 2. And the second term is going to be related to the variance. So it is this second term that is going to determine the asymptotic distribution of the difference between these two estimators. So uh, under the null hypothesis, only the second term remain, and then uh, we are able to uh, uh, derive uh, asymptotic distribution. And this, as a function of t, actually is going to be uh, converging to a Gaussian process with a covariant with a kernel function. Under the alternative, especially under a class of local alternative, uh, the difference between two estimators is converging to the same empirical process plus an additional term. This additional term is going to determine the non-centrality uh, parameter. Uh, so uh, our first result uh, just simply show that the left limit estimator subtract right limit estimator is going to converge to a, a, a multivariate normal distribution for each given point of time. And then uh, our statistic is a global version, right? It is the supreme norm or the maximum over each time period. So then uh, the, uh, we first of all need to construct a quadratic form. This is actually the wall type statistic for each given point of time. And if t is, little t is fixed, t0 is fixed, this is converging to chi-square. Uh, however, different t, the, for different t, this word type statistic are not asymptotically independent. So we need to consider the uh, the uh, the uh, supreme norm of this uh, this uh, word type statistic, and that actually shows up to be here. Uh, so this is the result. Uh, this phi here is the chi square or the what type statistic for each time point t or tau. And then uh, the, uh, our function g is going to be the, the supreme norm, right? Of course, you could also use the weighted integral, but then that is going to invoice the choice of weighting function. And uh, here, for simplicity, we just consider the supreme norm. So the, uh, our statistic is going to converge in distribution to a supreme norm of a chi-square process. And that chi-square process has a well-defined kernel function, and which actually is going to be here, right? So this is a chi-square process. Capital G here is a Gaussian process, and V star is the the uh, the, the kernel function. Uh, and then, in order to get uh, to make the test operational, uh, we need to find a way how to determine the uh, asymptotic critical, uh, how to de de determine the critical value, or how to find the p-value in practice. So, assuming the defined distribution, asymptotic distribution, is equal to f zero, so this capital F zero, then we could define the asymptotic p-value. So this p of capital T here is one subtract f zero. MT is going to be our supreme norm statistic. So this defines the asymptotic p-value. And now we are going to use Bruce Henson in his uh, 1996 econometric paper. He proposed a resampling method uh, that is able to get consistent estimate of the p-value uh, the, uh, in a, not the same but uh, similar content. So the way he did is to generate an artificial IID normal random error, V here, and then multiply. So this is the, uh, the sum of the uh, kernel and then the difference in score function, and then uh, V here is the original test statistic is just depend on K and E hat without this V. In order to get the critical value of the p-value, then uh, Bruce Henson, they, he multiplied the IID uh, uh, copy of the uh, uh, of this uh, sequence. It could be shown that 
So it could be shown that the way the, uh, we construct the uh, artificial test statistic, the, the resembling statistic, if we do it many times and we could get the empirical p-value, this empirical p-value is going to converge or it's going to be equivalent to the asymptotic p-value, especially under the no hypothesis of continuous changes, this p-value will converge to the significant level. And under the alternative, this p-value will converge to zero. So those are the theory. Now, the key issue here is that how to uh, choose the bandwidth that I already mentioned a bit earlier. And uh, of course, we could use a global bandwidth. That is, it does not depend on each time point t. However, a global bandwidth may be affected by a few uh, sudden breaks uh, in, the, in the sample. That will be very similar to the impact of an outlier. So uh, in this paper, we consider the, uh, a different time uh, bandwidth, uh, the, uh, depending on the curvature of those alpha. And uh, let's see how we do that. So this is a tele expansion of the left limit estimator, right? So the that limit estimator, alpha t hat subtract alpha t, uh, there are two terms. The first term is going to be related to the bias, and the second is related to the air term, the, uh, to the variance term, right? And then uh, the, uh, this is what we are going to do. So we are going to consider a so-called unconditional mean square air so this is the mean square area we are going to minimize in order to obtain the optimal bandwidth. Uh, so remember, yt is not stationary. So this expectation is not just a constant. This expectation actually will depend on time t. And uh, we could uh, decompose, do some decomposition. So the unconditional mean square area is going to be related to a term, bias term. This is square bias. And the other term is going to be the variance. So optimum bandwidth is going to be choose to minimize this unconditional mean square error, and it turned out to be equal to this formula. So it uh, depends on the total sample size, capital T, and it also depends on the air term variance, sigma T square, and it uh, depends on the curvature, right? the curvature of the, uh, the second derivative of alpha T. And this is the bandwidth to use to estimate the lab limit we have the similar formula to estimate the right limit. In general, the left limit bandwidth and the right limit bandwidth are going to be different, right? Un unless it is under the, the no hypothesis. So that optimal bandwidth, although it has a nice uh, uh, the, uh, closed form expression, but this is not feasible. It involves the unknown second derivative. So we are going to use uh, the, uh, a cross-validation. This is going to be just simply diff one hour estimator. Uh, so theta hat is a weighted least square estimator diff one hour. And then uh, we are going to choose optimum bandwidth to minimize the cross-validation. Uh, so this is the, the cross-validation criteria. And uh, the way we obtain the bandwidth, it could be shown in this theorem here, it could be shown that the cross-validation bandwidth actually is asymptotically equivalent to the theoretical optimal bandwidth that I derived earlier, the one that minimized the unconditional mean square error. And a similar uh, theory could be developed for the bandwidth used to estimate the right limit. Uh, in simulation, uh, we need to use the same bandwidth uh, for depth limit and right limit estimation because we want the bias to cancel to an even higher order. So our bandwidth is going to be the square root of the product of the left limit bandwidth and the right limit bandwidth. So now let me consider some simulation study. Uh, this is a data generating process where there exists no structural break. So and the uh, alpha tau is changing uh, not monotonic but smoothly. So this is an exponential functional form and uh, it implies this is continuous, so uh, the no hypothesis is going to be correct. We consider three different types of the air term UT here, IID normal, or the exit arch effect, that is typical in time series high-frequency data, or the exit conditional heterostatistic. 
By conditional heteroscedasticity, we mean that the conditional variance of ut given xt, given covariate, is a function of xt. And uh, we also consider uh, some other data generating process where only intercept change uh, quadratic form, right? So there's a square tau here. And uh, this one, both intercept and the uh, slope changes uh, linearly. So those are the three cases that we are going to consider. And we consider sample size 100, 200 in this case. And the uh, uh, duplication is going to be 1,000 times. Uh, and uh, in addition to cross-validation, we also use a plug-in method. The plug-in method is to estimate the second derivative of alpha t and then plug in the, the formula that we derive the theoretical uh, optimal bandwidth. Uh, we want to see that uh, which one perform uh, better in, in our setup. So this is the, uh, the size performance. Uh, so at a 5% significant level or 10% significant level, and there are three data generating process. Right? And uh, this corresponds to three different air terms. I'm sorry, I changed the notation to epsilon here. This will be UT. And uh, it, for cross-validation, you could see that at a 5% level, the uh, rejection rate is uh, reasonable in most cases. And at a 10% level, it is also uh, reasonable. And the uh, cross-validation performed better than uh, plug-in method. This one is the plug-in method. Plug-in method tend to be more over-reject in uh, uh, several cases. Right? And the uh, the performance are quite robust, no matter whether the air term is IID, arch, or conditional heteroscedasticity, and no matter whether the data generating process are smooth in different degree or order. And then we consider the power. So this is going to be two break, two uh, sudden break, right? There are two change point, and then there are uh, three change point here, and then uh, this is going to be the combination of multiple break and smooth changes, right? Earlier, there's only a sudden break, and then the parameter remain constant. Now, in addition to sudden break, the parameter is also changing continuously. And uh, we also consider two other unit and the uh, random walk in parameter. So this is uh, uh, the slope coefficient follow random walk. The slope and the, and the intercept both follow random walk, the two independent random walk in this case. One minute? Wow. Good. Okay, so I will finish uh, in one minute. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the power property, and uh, we see that the, uh, there's no any comparison, right? The, this is the only test we know. So the, uh, we just, uh, here we're just able to show that the test indeed has power uh, the, uh, uh, when the alternative uh, is true, and the power increase as sample size increase. We actually also apply this to uh, uh, the uh, real data. This is a predicting regression model for equity return. So yt is equity return, and xt will be one of the 14 uh, financial or macro variable here. Uh, that this exercise has been well studied in the empirical finance literature. And the conclusion we have here is that we run a bivariate regression, so only one covariate, and there are 14 regression in this case. Only three variables, uh, except for those three regression, all others, we they reject that the structural change is smooth. So that implies that in economic data, financial data, there exists uh, the sudden break. And I think I have to stop. Thank you.
material, but then you conclude that there is a, you know, uh, uh, abdominal structural break if you reject, you know, but you cannot have that structural break. It is a, some part is... Yeah, but when we reject, we can only conclude that okay, the, uh, okay. the, the, the this sudden break. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my comment is, okay, that in case of the intercept, this problem has been around since the 1950s. So I heard about this one from many parts of the United States. And using essentially very similar technique what you mentioned, it was proven the exact limit distributions like in the, in the 1970s. So I would say, okay, that the statement that there is nothing like this one mm -hmm. is only correct, okay, if you said, okay, that except just looking at the intercept case. Okay. So, so essentially, okay. like, the yeah. proofs are, are based on, okay, the classical papers of Bickel and Rosenblatt. So when you said, okay, this is related, okay, to Gaussian process and things like that one here, so what is the limit of this Gaussian process? Is Bickel and Rosenblatt from 1956 there? Yeah? So not IVC, okay, resampling is really needed if you would like to get some kind of asymptotic results. It may not be working for fixed sample sizes, mm -hmm. but, but IVC, okay, so much, much more is known about this one here. Of course, independence is assumed Okay, so this is like in the 1970s and things like that one. So that time nobody showed too much interest. Okay, so like you have dependence in the data that, but I, okay, what I would like to point out, people in statistics did much, much more. Yeah, about that okay, one. Thank yeah, you thank you. Uh, I wanted to make a similar comment uh, that uh, there are many papers on this problem. Uh, uh, one paper I am aware of is uh, Beran and Shumeiko. Uh, I don't know how long ago that was. And uh, there uh, a method is used that is different, uh, namely wavelet decomposition, where one uses father wavelets for the smooth component and mother wavelets for the non-smooth component, and one just tests whether the mother wavelet's contribution is zero or not. Uh, it's a, actually a very simple test, and that works very well. And so I just wanted to point out uh, the same. Uh, there is a lot of literature on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, our last speaker is Alejandra Cabana, mm -hmm. Preston, on the goodness of speed to the three parameter wide boot. running out of time, I would like to join myself to the club of people who thank the organizers for having put this great meeting and, uh, well, begin right away. Um, it's been some 15 years since I don't work in goodness of fit, really. So uh, I will try to present something that some uh, motivated by a question that some friends made me a short time ago about testing for a three-parameter weighable distribution. And me, instead of Googling and trying to find it done, I uh, tried to, OK, let's, say, let, let, let's see what I can do, what I have done before. And I ended up by uh, redoing everything I have done since the 19th, with another perspective. So I'll try to uh, explain this now. I had a lot of transparencies as well, and I made a trimming. So I guess, I hope, that what is left here is sufficiently representative of what I want to tell. OK, so uh, I began to work on goodness of fit in the 90s, uh, some papers in Annals, some papers somewhere else. And uh, the idea was that transforming the empirical process uh, worked well for developing goodness of fit tests for IID samples uh, that could be extended to gener uh, generalizing the techniques 
for constructing goodness of fit tests to, to location and scale families, essentially. And, other, and after that, uh, getting into more complicated settings for regression and uh, time series models. Uh, but that was it. Since the 2012, uh, I hadn't worked more in this subject. Uh, the idea was that the choice of the transformation and the design of the test were motivated by the asymptotic properties of the, statist the processes that were involved, and uh, all tests were consistent against uh, fixed alternatives. They were distribution-free. They were the final statistic that we used had the same asymptotic distribution regardless the family under testing, and the design could be tuned to optimize the asymptotic power for given alternatives. Uh, think of a test of normality. You wanted to uh, optimize the power against changes in, say, I don't know, kurtosis. So how do you do something like this? Something in the idea of Larikia's tests, but Larikia's tests are not consistent, and ours were. So, uh, well, location scale families have nice geometrical properties that other models do not share. And uh, the motivation for which I began work on this is because some friends needed a, a test for a three-parameter Weibull family, which is kind of more complicated from a geometrical point of view than a location scale family. There is the shape parameter, which is uh, nasty. If the shape parameter is not fixed, then you are even out of the exponential family of distributions, which is uh, a place we are not used to deal with. And uh, moreover, uh, well, the estimator of the third parameter, which is the location parameter, is the minimum of the sample, and then the distributions are not uh, differentiable with respect to that. So, uh, well, a lot of terrible problems. Okay, the original, the motivating example was a model for um, uh, geomagnetic storms. They needed to, well, uh, our, my colleagues, Mourinha and uh, Associates, what's the, where's the red thing? Well, I don't know. Uh, they were interested in modeling the interoccurrence time of geometric storms, of uh, intense geometric storms. And the idea was to have a model to compute the probability of a Carrington-like event, a Carrington event. A Carrington event was a strong geomagnetic storm that happened 160 years ago and left the planet without communications. Communications by that time was telegraph. Uh, and it was a massive disaster not having telegraph that they imagine now not having our GPS, uh, not having uh, our present communications, people unable to play Fortnite would be a disaster. So the idea is, um, well, what's the probability of having an event like this in the next uh, decade? And, uh, well, using a, a two-parameter, not three, but two-parameter Weibull distribution, uh, Mourinha and Associates found that that probability is really slow. We can still be confident, uh, more or less. Uh, it's quite unlikely that we have that, uh, an event like this. And uh, notice that previous models gave an estimate of 0.12, that probability of having a, a current like event. So... It's, it would be good that the model of Mourinha et al. is true so that uh, we can be more or less confident and continue killing zombies in Fortnite. So uh, that was the motivating example. Now what happens? So what's the abstract setting? Con so consider a general family of absolutely continuous con uh, distribution functions and real line uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the bag measure, of course. With the uh, densities F and consider the square root densities, uh, which are invertible and con 
C1 with respect to the parameter theta. Parameter can be multidimensional. Uh, square root densities are interesting because for two main reasons. Uh, one is that uh, square root densities are in the ball of radius 1 of L2 of F. So that's a nice place to live, a uh, Hilbert space. And the other reason is because they are a nice way of describing uh, contiguous alternatives. That's Osterhoff and Van Swett setting deals with the ratio of uh, the square root densities between the distribution of the sample and the null. So square root densities, that rows I have there, are important. Okay, uh, further imagine that the maximum likelihood estimate of theta is consistent and regularity conditions ensuring symptotic normality hold and fix a canonical distribution F theta naught. F theta naught not necessarily has to belong to the family F. It's easier in life to think that it does. For instance, if you are testing for normality, it is reasonable to think that F theta naught is normal zero one and life goes on. But uh, in fact, in the, in the example I will present, it's more comfortable to have another F theta naught, not in F. Okay, now ugly notation, I'm sorry. Uh, consider two transformations. One is the transform TF is the transformation that maps a random variable with distribution F to a random variable with distribution F0, that F that we fixed. Okay, that's easy to compute. We will apply that transformation to a, any random variable with an arbitrary distribution function G, so the probability distribution of that XG can be trivially computed in terms of compositions of uh, G, F, and F0. And uh, again, from, well, since we are going to deal with the square root of the densities, just uh, simple chain rule allows us to write uh, the square roots of the densities of that transformation. They, they look ugly, but they are straightforward. Okay. And the same thing we will do with the square roots of the density. We will define a function that sends the square root of the density of a random variable with distribution x to the square root of the density of the random variable under the transformation. And uh, that transformation is an isometry in L2. That bunch of straightforward integrals show that this is uh, an isometry. So uh, TF of rho F is rho zero, the, the square root of the density of the selected F. Okay, with that ugly notation, uh, ah, no, we need data. Uh, so looking at the data, what are the data? The data are triangular arrays of uh, uh, run IID variables. Each uh, row has distribution Fn independent among them. We have the square root densities written in such a way that, uh, well, we, that uh, row n equal row zero times one plus delta Km blah 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 is saying that the uh, the row the Xn's are contiguous to row zero uh, at um, they converge they they approach row z the the distribute the row the density of uh, the sample approaches the density uh, the f zero density at uh, rate one over square root n through a path with tangent vector k n that converges uh, to uh, square root integrable k. So that, that's the, the, the k is the direction of the asymptotic alternative. Okay, so uh, everything works well under this setting. And now we need a more notation. We 
have the sample and introduce the standardized sample, which is taking the sample to the distribution F0. That, that can't be done because you don't know the distribution of the sample. So you estimate it with the estimator of theta n. And then uh, build uh, empirical processes. The original empirical process, the empirical process related to F0, and the estimated standardized empirical process, which is the one that you can really compute. The, the last one is the one that you can really compute. So everything we do has to be based on uh, the last line, which should be able to use the pointer, but I'm not. Okay. So, uh, okay, the standardized empirical process converges to an F0 Brownian bridge. That's well known. So, given any orthonormal basis of uh, L2 related to the fixed measure F0, has the, the formal derivative of the noise has uh, converges to standard Gaussian random variables. That's well-known fact. That's a way of characterizing this. Okay, so what happens if you don't have Vn0? You, we have an estimation of that. So what, what goes on? Well, life is nice. It converges to the same thing plus a drift, and the drift has to do with how you estimate the alternatives and how is the shape of the alternatives. So uh, there, they, there we go. The estimated standardized variables has, have known distribution function, and this implies that the estimated empirical process can be written as the sum of something that behaves asymptotically as a Brownian bridge plus that square root 10 f uh, zeta hat minus f0, that is the term that has to be studied. Uh, let's go back to testing normality. If you do that, then what you have is Durbin's result on the convergence of, uh, of the empirical process under estimated parameters. And what will, what will we end up if we were testing for normality? We would end up with something that has to do with estimation of the mean, that is a polynomial of degree one, and something that has to do with the estimation of the variance, which is a polynomial of degree two. So we can have a nice orthonormal basis with the Hermit polynomials, uh, the first two polynomials being uh, the ones corresponding to estimating the mean, estimating the variance, we are there, nothing happens, and whatever is orthogonal to that would be detected. So if you want to detect changes in symmetry, okay, put as the, first, as the next guy in the orthonormal basis for the space, Hermit polynomial of order three. If you want to detect changes in kurtosis, then put as the first guy in the uh, orthogonal world, Hermit polynomial of order four. Uh, and, and, and life is beautiful. Okay, things are more ugly when going to things that are not uh, location scale invariant, of course. Uh, why? For instance, in the case of the Weibull thing, uh, the basis that generates the tangent space are not polynomials, unfortunately. There is one polynomial that has to do with the uh, a translation thing, but the other things, the other functions are ugly. And uh, of course you can compute uh, an orthonormal basis and of course you can do things, but they are ugly. Okay, but, 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 but that's, uh, that was more or less the end of the talk. Uh, so I, I should go back to, the, to, where, to where we are now. Okay, so the first term converges to the Brownian bridge and the second term converges to something that has to do with the difference between the um, empirical process respect to the uh, F and the transformed variables. Okay, so what's, what, how do the Fourier coefficients with respect to so some orthonormal basis, which I haven't said which is. 
and I, and I will not say it uh, for a long while. Okay, so that can be computed more or less easily, and you end up by realizing that what you have is something that's related to the tangent space at the now plus a drift that has to do with uh, the shape of the alternatives. If we put delta equal, the, that delta thing is the drift, and if delta is zero, then we are under the null, and if delta is not zero, then what you end up with is an inner product of the guys in the bases time, uh, times the, the shape of the alternative. So that's why I was saying that, okay, if you want to detect changes in kurtosis, what should you put? Well, you should put that uh, inner product. Uh, it would be, the drift will be magnified in the direction of H4. That, that's, what, that's why things work. Okay, so we have this theorem. If we have a sequence of IID samples with distribution theta no, then if, no. Uh, that should be theta n. That should be... Uh, if Bihat is the estimated empirical process, we have a orthonormal, uh, orthonormal basis that generate the same subspace of L2 as the image by thou of the tangent space in the nil. You can put whatever system you want that generates that image. Uh, and you have another orthonormal basis, then the Fourier coefficients converge to IID standard Gaussian. And when we are under the null, then uh, we have something that converges to the same Gaussian random variables plus delta times uh, those uh, inner products. So this is exactly the setting where we were when we worked when our, uh, the, 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 the standard things. I, I'm not really sure I could mm, reflect in this picture what's going on. Uh, I, I'll try to explain it, but don't, don't, don't I, I, I don't know how to draw in latex. This is drawn in latex directly, put, put, put. So, uh, Okay, so uh, if the rho theta zero, rho theta zero, when, when the estimator converges to theta zero, then the estimated uh, square root densities converge to the estimated, uh, ow, I need the pointer. So I'm sorry, I guess these pictures are misleading. So these rows are, if these rows are closed, that, 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 there's a hat over there even. So if uh, the parameter, the, the estimator converges to the true value of the parameter, then the square roots uh, converge and everything's okay under the null. But, but under the alternative, the tangent planes not necessarily converge adequately uh, because because uh, the transformation done with the data, with the estimation, over uh, the row n might not even be in the tangent plane. It would in the case of uh, testing for normality or location scale things, because everything remains in the tangent plane. But otherwise, no. So you, you, you would get out of it. Mm, that's better because it helps detecting alternatives, but uh, geometry gets com more complicated. So once we are in that situation, the standard procedure that we used in the past that led to consistent tests that have the same asymptotic distribution and that could be optimized uh, can be done in the same way as before. The optimizing thing, as I said before, 
the optimizing thing comes from the fact that the drift is the inner product of uh, the guy in the basis times the the shape of the alternative. So put that the bigger you can. So put psi j equal to k, and that's it. So the optimizing thing is the easier part of the deal. And the, well, the, the, the procedure is, okay, from the sample, compute the maximum likelihood estimate, choose the canonical distribution, compute the standardized sample. Okay, choose an orthonormal basis that generates that tangent space. And now compute a quadratic form. Quadratic uh, statistics are better than, than others. Uh, the ugly shape of the coefficients uh, has to do with things we've done in the past. If someone's interested in knowing why coefficients look like this, we can discuss that later. And reject for large values of that quadratic statistics, the asymptotic statistics of this uh, QN is known. We, we can compute it. It's a sum of chi-squares under the null and under the alternatives is a sum of chi-squares plus something. Uh, okay, and the three-parameter Weibull thing. Okay, Weibulls are ugly because the distribution is not the even differentiable in L2 with respect to the location parameter, so we have to use another characterization of the Weibull family that allows us to do that, and that characterization is very nice. If you have N plus one Weibulls, Compute the minimum, subtract it all over, uh, rescale things, and what you have is, with that uh, way of defining the new variable, what you have is an independent sample of the exponential one, ordered, an ordered sample. So the unordered sample has a more ugly distribution, but this other thing, ah, and you lose one datum. Because if you want to have them independent, then you cannot use the minimum. But this is an unordered sample. The, the, then the unordered sample, this unordered sample has this weird distribution, uh, which uh, is differentiable, blah, blah, blah. Okay, compute the partial derivative so you know the shape of the tangent space. So the tangent space is generated by these three things. One of them is a nice polynomial. The other two are ugly. Okay, so form an orthonormal basis with, of course, you need one. We, we need the constants. So take one. Take uh, z minus one, which is the first Laguerre polynomial, and then complete a basis, uh, well, putting Gram-Smith, with those two ugly vectors that have, we have there, and compute the rest of the basis of the space. We need the four first ones, uh, one, two, three, four, and then the rest of the space, blah, blah, blah. We cannot deal with all the bases, so we need to choose where to stop the sum. We chose 10. Uh, the first four, we need them for the tangent space. The other ones are for the orthogonal part. Okay, so... The components of that quadratic form are standard normal, and uh, well, matrix can be computed. If we compute it from the Laguerre polynomial, we can use another set of polynomials, but if we compute it from the Laguerre polynomials, then we have a closed form for computing the uh, coefficients, and well, the thing works well. Uh, I mean, under Weibulls, uh, ah, I didn't say that. Look at the third line of that table. Those are sample sizes obtained by simulation, and uh, the power of the Weibull, the, the third line, should be close to 5%, is much bigger. Well, that's because of two things. One of them is that estimating C, estimating the shape parameter of the Weibull when it's smaller than one, is really difficult. It's, uh, it's awful. And the other reason is because the approximation with the, of the tangent space with the basis is not good. 
So we have a couple of pictures showing, well, that's the critical values obtained by simulation for C bigger than one, which are right, but for C smaller than one are ug really ugly. So we have to work more on that. And this is okay, this is due. From, you know, from one side to the maximum likelihood estimate, this is uh, mean square error for the estimation of the shape parameters in samples of size 200, which is big, and it's really bad. The, estimate, the mean square errors are really big for C is more than one or really big. This is uh, a fact of life. Everybody has these problems, no? not only us. And the other problem are numerical errors in the computation of the orthonormal basis. We can work on that. It's a purely numerical thing. These are the Hessians that behave really bad, especially for small values of x. So the approximation of the tangent space is not really working well, especially for small c, again, and things like that. And, okay, for the real data thing, uh, since I don't have more time, uh, okay, uh, for the real data thing, we have computed, uh, the problem are big storms, okay? So big storms are those who are, which are bigger than, say, 15 in that, oh, can you read that? The, the marks are 0, 10, 20, 30, okay. Uh, storms above 15 are considered of high magnitude. Uh, the Carrington effect, the Carrington thing was of size 25 in that scale. So, uh, okay. P-values are big, so Weibull, three-parameter Weibull seems okay. And on the 20th of August appeared, no, 19th of August, appeared in CRAN, in the repository of R, a package that computes Weibull, Weibull things. So uh, we have used this, that package to compute, and in our p-values and the p-values obtained with that package are more or less the same. We haven't computed, uh, we haven't made simulations with their package. It was the 20th of August. I was on holidays. So, um, well, this is it. And, uh, well, apparently the Weibull thing is a good model, so we can be confident that no terrible solar storms will come on us. Thank you.